If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, oh, rah, yeah. for the first 56 minutes, we have our introductory conversation. We talk about our upcoming Viore event. Finally, we're going on tour. This, new, new, new. this is a new thing for us. We've never done anything like this before. We're, we're, we're going out there. What are we doing, Adam? We're shaking babies and, and kissing hands. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's about the right order. Yeah. That's uh, right. We gave a little update. Bring on, your babies. <laughs> on Adam's Achilles <laughs> Not tendon. Adam. And yeah. wash your hands. <laughs> we actually do a, a, a nice long stint of sports talk. Wow. It was oh, so, energy- it was so enjoyable God. for that me. That did happen. Yeah, I talked about Maybe sports. my favorite Mind Pump episode. You know what? <laughs> Pigs are flying outside yeah. right now. Then we talked about a documentary that we all uh, just recently watched called, called The Magic Pill. You can see it on Netflix. It's a pretty powerful documentary about how food can cure uh, many of our chronic ailments. Now, we do mention Thrive Market. They are the the largest uh, producer, or at least I should say distributor, of non-GMO organic products online. Um, and the prices you get on there are unparalleled. Very inexpensive, two-day shipping. We have got a hookup for Mind Pump listeners. So here's what you do. You go to thrivemarket.com forward slash Mind Pump. You'll get a month free membership plus $20 off your first three orders of $49 or more, plus free shipping. So go check it out. We also talk about tricks that we use to get our kids to make better choices. Good, Yeah, good, we good tricked you. Lots of tomfoolery going on here. <laughs> that's an old term. Oh, yeah. That's then we get into like the questions. Like scrim scram, like that's, you got me for the other day. The <laughs> <laughs> then we get into the first, That was a good one. Like, uh, the first question was, what are some tips to stay on track with your diet when your partner is eating terribly? Like, what are the things you can do besides breaking up with them? <laughs> Which is an option. <laughs> that's that's the number one trick that is. and tip. <laughs> yeah. The next question was, this person's 24 weeks pregnant, is lifting weights, and is concerned about recruitment patterns changing as her belly and body uh, grow and change. So what do we recommend during pregnancy and post-pregnancy to deal with these differing different recruitment patterns. The next question was, if this person's strength keeps increasing while they're following a good program like MAPS Anabolic, does that mean the metabolism is speeding up? In other words, if you're getting stronger, is that a sign that your metabolic system is amping up or heating up so you're burning more calories? And finally, this individual has been a personal trainer for about seven months, so they're a new trainer. And they keep having male clients that just want to lift heavy weight right out the gates. They don't want to do the correctional stuff. They don't want to work on that's weird. Proper men aren't usually like that. Yeah, exactly. Movement patterns. How do you deal with this if you're a trainer? How do you deal, especially if you're female and you have male clients who just want to impress you with the twenty pound dumbbells that they can curl? <laughs> also, this month you can get our fasting guide and our intuitive nutrition guide for free. For free. You can get things out of it. Yeah. You can get them for free if you enroll in any bundle. Now, we know summer's coming up, so a lot of people are interested in getting leaner. A big, big part of that is your nutrition. Well, if you enroll in any bundle, now, bundles are where you take uh, multiple MAPS programs, put them together, discount them like 30% off. You'll get those two guides for free this month only. Uh, you can find all of this at mindpumpmedia.com. When's the the our first event of the tour that we're doing? Is that the is that an Encinitas? Yeah, yeah. that's Viore. in a week, right? Yeah, May well, tenth. I think we're nine days away or so, man. This is right next away. Thursday, I believe. So May tenth, it's the Viore event in Encinitas. You guys know I used to manage. You guys know I managed the twenty four fitness there for one month. No, you didn't know that. So when I when I left twenty four the first time because I, I worked there twice. When I left the first time, I had my gym in Palm Springs or whatever. And then when I came back, I was supposed to work in Southern California for uh, a, a, a VP there that I liked a lot. And he was going to give me a big club, but there were none available. So he gave me Encinitas for a month in the interim. And I ended up coming back up to San Jose. But it was the smallest club I'd ever run. It was a tiny little fun gym, though. Nice town. Hmm. Was it one of their like little single A boxes like you know what it's like express you ever been to the, yeah you ever been to the saratoga 24 the one that on cox 
Is that the Express one? Oh, yeah, I've been there. It's not Express. They've been around for a while. Mm. So they didn't build it that way. It was just a small club. Oh, mm. I don't remember that one. Yeah, so the one in Encinitas, I ran that for ex- exactly one month. And But what a great little town. It's like a nice little beach town. Isn't our boy um, Josh Trent from around that area? He's San Diego. Maybe. Yeah, San Diego. I actually think he's... Well, Encinitas? Yeah, it's not far from each other, right? They're only like 20, 30 minutes, isn't it? Uh, mm. Yeah. You yeah. guys will love You guys don't love it down there. Sweet. Uh, so we're going down the 10th, and then that's the live Q&A. Are there still signups for it, Doug? Yeah, there are. If you go on to our website at www.mindpumpmedia.com forward slash tour, you can sign up. And it's very important to put the www at the beginning. Otherwise, it won't work. It can will they, not what, work. What if they uh, click the link directly from the show notes? We'll take them straight Yes, there. that's okay. another way to do it. Okay, okay. so show notes will have it. Yeah, that's cool. Excellent. I'm, Dude. Ex- I'm excited, man. This it, Also, I know at the Viore event, um, at the Viore event, they will have uh, the 25% off of all Viore for why they're there, too. Oh, so, so why are they getting a discount? That's yeah, awesome. So everybody gets hooked up on a fat discount there, which, you know, 25% off the stuff. Oh, like, they got sick gear there. So yeah. You're so going to want to use that. And then Mir, I'm not going to tell you what we do, which is the end of the tour. And this is the beginning. I'm going to slightly hype this up a little bit because this is the plan is that if all goes well and we have an incredible turnout uh, on these, like it's looking like it's going to be already, because I think we're already half or three quarters full on most of them. How many people are supposed to attend the, this one here in Viewer? What, how many? Uh, I think the max we can fit in these places are about 100. Okay. So it's it's more, it's more depending on which location, and I know Taylor's managing all that with, with the companies, and so you know it's going to, everybody who wants to come has to send, put submit. And then from there, we'll we'll take an order of mm. how they came in, how many total we can we'll we'll get back to everybody. But what I was getting at was, if you know, if this begin becomes something that we we start doing, where we head to different states and we tour and hit a couple locations of of mm. brand partnerships, is at the end of these tours, we'll have something cool that that people can get that will be limited and unique mm. at just that just that one event. And is it the nude photos of Doug? No, this is something okay. that uh, we're we're saving that. We're this will be that. something really cool too. It won't be like some bullshit like that. You just you know some. It won't be like one of our sponsors' fucking package. No, or only like the that. coolest of cool kids will get them. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna be it's it, one of those kind of. That's things. the that's the idea. It's gonna be something that is unique and cool. You won't be able to buy it. You won't be able to get anything. You'll only be able to get it at the at the live event. Oh, so, good deal. Yeah, I'm excited for this, man. It's gonna be a good time. Question: You have an armband or something on your ankle? Is that? It's that company. Which one? This one. And I keep giving them love on the show. And that's for... They're, they're, uh, that's getting, the, lucky. they're getting lucky right now. That's, <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't even planned. Yeah, they're definitely not paying us. I, I don't know if it was an East Coast, West Coast thing or something like the rappers back in the day or no, something weird no, like it's, that. No, it's, it's, it's one of these... Infrared. Yeah, infrared sleeves and stuff. Man, I tell you what, when we went to Paleo... Um, you know, back to, we had back to back days where I was pushing over twenty thousand steps, and up, up up till since the injury, I haven't done more than twelve. Mm. That's been I've been where I worked up, and eight to ten was a lot. Then ten to twelve, I've been like slowly. Is that what we were hitting about twenty? Because you had your thing on yeah. the tracker. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were yeah, that oh, so one night so especially. Yeah, yeah. We had both. There was two days back to, and so I've just been in a lot of pain the last two days. It fucking hurts, man. And you know, it's. <clears throat> I, and I can tell, so there's still damage. You know, it's not fully healed mm-hmm. for sure, and uh, it's been one of the hardest injuries I've had to deal with. So I had to kind of back it off a little bit. Katrina was doing work on it. I've, yeah, tendons take a while to heal, it, much longer than muscles. Oh man, it's oh, yeah. much longer. But you not know, a lot of blood supply. The, the good news is, or the or the the bright side is, as tough as it's been, it's been a fast recovery in comparison to how most people react to or how their bodies react to this kind of a. I mean, a partial tear of Achilles. People are out for a long time. Yeah, no. Everybody that's told me that's like had it had it bad. They told me like, man, I don't, I didn't feel normal till a year later. Exactly. And shit. So, you know, and I can totally get that. I mean, it, it doesn't look like I'm going to be playing ball or jumping or anything crazy anytime soon because, like I said, the the pains are. I mean, I did some training while we were. You guys, I think, were napping or or somewhere else in the pool. Uh, which was really nice because I don't have access to like a four foot pool like mm-hmm. that anywhere nearby. So that was really nice. That's when you were running across the pool. Yeah, yeah. So I was doing not on the water in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he's <laughs> like a ninja. Yeah, man. Yeah. So I was doing some work in the he pool. Can walk on water. That felt really. That felt really good to do that. So. But you're able to squat and are you? Can you deadlift yet? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I oh, uh, wow. I haven't pushed the deadlift as far as strength wise. It's gonna be harder, I think. Yeah, the the mm-hmm. squat I can though. The squat I've been I've been squatting decent. It feels good to to get back. That's the biggest thing for me. I I just feel good that I can walk normal. Um, when it gets really bad, I limp. Like last night, we were at the Warriors game, and you know, from, oh, how was that by the way? Oh, epic, bro. Did they win, dude? We won. Okay, so check this out. So Stephen Curry has been out uh, for God, I think six eight weeks now. And we won the first series against San Antonio in five games without him. That's our star player, right? And it was so dope. Part of why I wanted to go to this game was kind of a last minute decision with Katrina is, you know, we've agreed that we're going to go to every round of the playoffs for both the Warriors and the Sharks. And so last night on a win, we're just like, let's go. Let's go to this game because this is game. This is the first game Stephen Curry's coming back. We're yeah. home. And so I want was to see fire. Well, I missed it. So completely, listen, how this, so. listen how this goes down. So we get there and you don't know going into the game. Like you, they say he's cleared. He's going to play. Mm. Is he going to start or is he going to come off the bench? And you don't know until game time comes around and they announce the starting lineup and he doesn't start. So he's not, they're not going to start him just to want to mm. give him a little mm-hmm. bit give extra, a little, little extra buffer. rest. Yeah, yeah. Ease him in. And about uh, midway through the first, and it was a close game. It was uh, that I think when he came in, we were actually down by two. And he comes in, and when he goes to the scores table to check in, the entire arena fucking stands up, dude. Standing, oh, standing, shit. oh, just to welcome him in. Oh shit! And every, while everyone's standing, clapping, he checks in. We're still standing and clapping, getting ready to sit down. First play, he has touches the ball, fucking drains a three. Place oh. erupted. <laughs> He's he, such a stud, bro. It erupted. Then he oh, came man. down the very next play. Ran the offense like impeccable backdoor pass for a layup. The place was, I mean, you just wanted to rip your shirt off and throw it on the fucking <laughs> on the court. It was that kind of energy inside. Oh, yeah. dude, it was that kind of energy inside there. Yeah. Steve Kerr afterwards was being interviewed, and he said that's the loudest he's ever heard Oracle since he's been there. And it was so it was dope to be there in that environment oh, shit. That's at, awesome, the, dude. at that intimate of a level, too. So we were, I was about. What was the score at the end? The final score we we ended up winning by I think was five or six was the the final. We oh, were so it was by, a close game. Yeah, it was oh the whole game was close until about the towards the end of the fourth. Uh, Durant had fifteen in the fourth quarter, really pulled away. We were up by about thirteen at one point, uh, and then when so when I had two minutes left, I started to, I try and sneak away like the last two minutes so I get in front of traffic. And if it's not a close, if it's if we have enough of a spread that I know we're going to win, so. I, I left, so I didn't watch the last tw- uh, two minutes. I listened to the last two minutes on the in the car. Um, I wouldn't mind, you know, like I said, I'm not huge into most sports, but I would definitely not mind going to a game like that. You know, you know what I mean? So because oh, of the audience, you yeah. know what I mean? The crowd, and I understand. I know basketball. I know football. I can watch. I know what's going on. Um, so I, I, I could. I would Bro, like to do I, that. a lot of times. That's what wins people into becoming a absolutely. Fan. Yeah, I know. I was a. I, I've told you guys. I don't think I've ever shared this on air before, but. I was like, I as a kid, I was being an athlete, playing sports. Like we were, you know, football, baseball, basketball, soccer. Those are all kind of the sports that I played and was around. And we weren't. We lived in, you know, the valley, hot area, and stuff like that. No one had hockey rinks or anything like that. So we hated hockey. Yeah. And I and what I why I say I hated hockey was I was so much into sports. I watched Sports Center every single night. I watched all the news. I knew what was going on in all sports. And when hockey would come on, yeah. we'd all my buddies. I'm like, ah, hockey's on. Wait, yeah, yeah it's wait. All the real highlights. Came right. On. And we yeah. used to joke when when hockey season's going on, they actually get a couple of the highlights in the top ten Sports Center. And oh, what a waste! It's hockey. What a waste! We never show the fighting. Right. And so yeah, I, we like, just used to talk so much shit about hockey and a lot of that was just naive i wasn't around it didn't play it and so you know i thought it was a lame game and my buddy back in i want to say 2004 or so 2003 2004 ish while i'm living in the bay area i've been here for a few years he calls me up and he's like hey i got tickets to the sharks and i'm like hockey I mean, I'm fucking, and I don't even know what part of the season it is for hockey. That's how disconnected I am to hockey. I don't give a shit, right? He's like, he's like, yeah, yeah, man. It's uh, they're in playoffs right now. It's a playoff game, and I'm like, uh, I don't know, dude. I got shit going on. I got to work tomorrow early morning. He's just like, come on. I got center ice about ten rows back, probably with the best seats you can get in hockey because I've sat everywhere, and ice is cool to do that on the ice and on the glass as an experience, but it's not the best view. I think best view is center ice or behind the goalie and about ten rows back. So we're sitting, that's my first experience, is I come into this playoff game, and man, as soon as they came out on the ice to start it, the place was, and remember, I'm an, I'm an athlete, I'm a sports guy, I've been to a ton of sports events, I'd never felt something as electric 
as being in the Shark Tank for a oh, playoff yeah. game. Playoff hockey is and I like nothing else. Instantly, goosebumps all over my body, and I was like, holy shit, this atmosphere is rad. And then when you're watching the game live, see, TV is following the puck. Mm-hmm. And a sport like hockey, much like football, much like soccer, a lot of these sports that have a big, wide, spread out field, the camera misses oh, a lot of the good parts. So much more drama oh. going on. People getting hit, you know, yes. like taking people out, like yes. plays like forming in the background. Like you see like how they're, you know, they're, they're kind of moving and swooping into position. Like you don't see any of that shit on TV. So man. I instantly fell in love with the sport of hockey. It was later in my life when I was in my mid-20s. And I would arguably say now that it's up there, if not my favorite, it's top three favorite sports uh, to watch now, especially if I'm watching live because awesome. live, live hockey, hockey is epic. And so is basketball. If you get to sit down yeah, basketball close, basketball kind of sucks if you're really far away just because you feel so away from the game. But you know what? I'm a little like, uh, I'll be honest, dude, football in person. It's the worst. It does not have worst. the same impact. I don't like it. It's, it's the much. worst. It's really? Yeah, yeah, because the, the best seats in football you can't get a good eye of everything. The best seats in football are fifty yard line, yeah. right the very front row. Like it doesn't Which get better. Which I've said a few times, right. and it is exciting, but it's just it's still when you, a, when you put apples to apples against like you know hockey or mm-hmm. basketball, you don't get immersed into the action. Like you're you too do. far away. Yeah, yeah. you're some, too far away some, from everything. You know, I, uh, there's so, fifty yards. There's fifty yards away from the guy who's sitting in the best seats of the house. Fifty yeah. yards, best seats of the house from an actual player. Yeah. That's a long ways, yeah. dude. Yeah. Like basketball, it hockey, it matters. If you're if you get glass seats in hockey, yeah. the dude could hit the glass yeah. in your face. You see their fucking yeah, you cheek can, just. Yeah, you, can, <laughs> you yeah. can touch them practically. Yeah. Basketball, if you're Blood, if you're courtside or close to courtside, the fucking player could fall in your lap. Same thing for soccer. Same thing. There's a baseball. Even baseball, a ball could hit you, or the guy could dive into your lap catching the ball. So you're more you're in the sport. Football, you're so disconnected from it, and with so many players on the field at once, there's a lot of play, there's in football. There's more players on the field at once, all in the same area than anywhere else. So it's really easy to miss a lot mm-hmm. of stuff happening. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how many times I've been into a live football event, think I'm following the play yeah. because it was a fake or something like that, and you're just kind of like, <laughs> I know. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'll go, dude. I'll go if we go to one of those games. I'd love to go with you guys. I'll be honest about my critique. You know what I mean? If I like it or not. <laughs> oh, you'd love it, dude. I probably I, will. I, I feel. I feel like I will if if I'm there. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. I, I I think we're all I think we're all equally um even though we're not all equally the same into sports and into the same things like that we're all cerebral guys yeah. and that's the part where I think that you would always really dig about this is the de- the the more you dive into sports I think it's one of the greatest expressions of f- the uh you know training and dieting and getting your bodies prepared to perform at the it's- highest most optimal level and then you add that with some of the most brilliant minds that actually take it's like it's war that's what i was going to mo- say it's modern day yeah. war yeah that's what know? i say for me it's when i watch sports that's literally what i see is i see organized war with rules yes. and, and no killing yes and so then i find it fascinating especially you know football for me is the most fascinating only because it's so it's so much closer to modern warfare than other sports because you have players that are, look so different from each other like a cornerback looks so different from a lineman looks so different from a safety and a quarterback and a running back and it's like you have your tanks you have your planes you have your mm-hmm. your seat your 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 you know your your ships and they're all different shapes and sizes because of their different roles so when you watch the game it's for me it's pretty cool because it's so strategic it's down to the the size of the players. Well, and as as you become a deeper and deeper fan, and I won't bore our audience that doesn't give a shit about sports <laughs> and stuff, but no, let's do it. We never as, talk about it. But as you get deeper into the sport, and all of them are u- them. are no, unique to themselves, whether it be baseball, football, basketball, hockey, whatever we're talking about, that the average person who shows up and watches a game that's just like a what we call like a weekend warrior type of a fan yeah. who's just watching the sport for the score, like that's. That's nowhere near as as entertaining to me as really understanding the strategy of the game mm-hmm. and seeing it happen that the average person doesn't see. You know, there for example, like a game like hockey that moves so fast, there's constantly rotations happening. So there's mm-hmm. guys that are coming on and off the ice, on and off the ice, the whole entire game. But every move that the guy, that the the coach plays, as far as putting a team out there. There is a there's a deeper strategy to that, you know. And there's certain guys on the team that are designed to go after and hurt players on the other team, enforcer. or protect guys yeah. on our team. It's just and, you know it's how we organize ourselves, yeah, and I find it fascinating. It's very clear. It's very black and white. But business is like this too, you know. You have a big business. You have your 
players that are really good at sales. You have your players that are really good at, you know, math and you've got the people that are really good at marketing and you just put your people in their positions and, and then run the play. Mark, Mark Cuban's book is great because he uses, and I love, I love Mark Cuban. Um, and I think you're right. I think that there are so many parallels to business and sports. It's and all, it's what it is. It's not even business and sports. It's just what humans do. Like it's what we do when we organize, you know, yeah. you, you're, you're better off when you get people who are good at specific things, doing particular playing particular roles and then everybody works together when you combine these roles and then that's when you get that's when you succeed it's the the team that and your business whatever but it's the team that where the players are in the best positions for themselves and everybody just executes mm-hmm. and so that will always trump a superstar you know or whatever if you have people in the wrong positions you can have the best people in the world but if you have the best sales people in the world and you have them doing your engineering and you have the best engineers in the world and they're doing your sales, you're fucked. You're not going to succeed. So, you know check, I mean? so check this out. This is something that um, happened to me at being a diehard basketball fan. I went through about a 10 year stint where I stopped watching basketball. And part of the reason why I did, and I, what I used to say, I, I used to, and I know there's going to be some fans who are not going to like this, going to hate this shit, but I call it the Kobe era and it turned me off for the sport because we, what had happened is Basketball became larger than life, and you know part of that's through shoes and t- television and advertising and things like that. And it became you started to see it turn from a you know great team sport into uh, these in unbelievable individuals that could do things that nobody else on the court could do. And Kobe Bryant and the Michael Jordans and these guys are examples of that. And we really lost this great like playing sports. It was like who had the best player in the yeah. league. Who can we idolize? Right. Yeah. And so I just, I fell out of faith. I stopped watching it. I didn't yeah. like it at all. And the Spurs about 15, 15 years ago or so really started to model their franchise differently. And it was more, it was, the team was bigger than the person and the individual. And they started to, to build that around players that had the same attitude. And then the culture started from the top all the way down. And something about them that like a lot of average people probably don't know about that is that the Spurs have been in the playoffs for 19 years straight consistently, regardless of how talented. Now, they've had great players on their team, but the, it, the most important piece was how they played. Now, the Warriors have modeled their franchise after that in the last 10, well, probably eight years or so, I'd say, is when we And they're raced. winning. Oh, yeah. And now you're watching it in full, like after all these years of, of putting the, all these systems into place, mm-hmm. of being team ball, of being about the team and not individuals, and we're just fucking everybody up. And it's one of my favorite things to see is to see like when we collectively come together on something, how much more powerful we are than we are individuals. It just so, goes to show you when people mm-hmm. organize themselves, what they can what they can accomplish in sports is just a very clear black and white representation of that. It's very easy to see in comparison to like society or whatever. But it's when people voluntarily work together and do what they're good at and everybody does their role. It's pretty pretty awesome. It's fascinating to see how much the ego plays a role in that and how challenging that is uh, for people. That's right. You know, it's it's tough. And I don't know what drove that. I don't know what drove us to, I mean, obviously we evolved and got here by working with each other and helping each other. And then we evolved so much that it got to a point where if people started to think that, oh, I can handle this and do this all on my own. I don't know where that stemmed from or whatever. But Well, the irony is we all, I mean, especially in market-based societies, uh, it is people working together. It might not look like it, but the reality is, you know, if you're listening to this podcast on your phone, there's like countless millions of people that, you know, work together that culminated in the technology of that of that particular phone and putting that phone in your hand, and that's direct and indirect. You know, every piece of that phone, from the glass to the to the technology that makes it run, is the culmination of people working together voluntarily in to serve their best interests, their own best interests. You know, have you seen the Have you seen Brad Pitt's movie uh, Moneyball? No, I no, was you guys okay. About that. So let me talk about this because uh, you had mentioned that, and that was like a standout thing for me that turned me off of baseball. I'm a huge A's fan. Mm. Okay, so we're talking about, you know, how basketball kind of turned into like idolizing these champions and like the the champion is my champion is is Michael Jordan and you know and you're sort of like lifting up these these individual players as like the carrier of the team versus this mentality where moneyball is, you know, let's just turn this all into a numbers and let's let's 
now bring in people that are role players that statistically we can predict, you know, the outcome of this game. And, you know, based off of numbers, we're going to win X amount of games, you know, if people just, you know, succumb to their roles and they just put out the amount of effort we want them to put out and do what they want them to do. And, you know, as a fan, that has fucking killed that team for me. Killed oh. it. Because oh. there's no loyalty. You start, you start, um, putting effort into, you know, players on the team and, and knowing them and getting their backstory and finding out how they came through, you know, minor leagues. And um, now they're in the pros and now you're on your team. This is your team that they're on, right? And you're out there cheering for them. And guess what? This got traded. <laughs> and now another one comes yeah. in, replaces it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, there's this shifting, there's this moving up. Op- they, they do it like way before, you think they would trade somebody just to be able to get the, the the right pick? It's so a balancing act because oh my god, because if you're, me off. if you're owning this one of these teams, you're, there's a balancing act. On one hand, you want to win games because nothing's going to sell merchandise and, and fill seats like a winning team. But at the same time, if you make the fans unhappy with how you're doing it, yeah, that's, also, a, that's so a, it's very, a balancing act. It's a very unique perspective to hear you say that because I'm actually I fucking I think Billy Bean will go down in history and be we be spoken about for hundreds of years going forward. And in, in well, game he's a pioneer. That hey, he revolutionized the game. Now, now almost every team has modeled modeled that or at least taken from that. That look at we don't have to go out and get a big name if we actually do our homework and like find these mm-hmm. these gyms that fit into our system and our piece and and are now really successful. The money ball piece of it of you know run, managing because the A's are the most profitable team in the league. Yeah, that's you know not the Yankees, so not the Red Sox. Well, when the, you saw the Red Sox, it actually worked. Right, they won a championship. So then it's right. working. Right, yeah. but yeah. it didn't work for the A's yet. Right, right, and and maybe that's because the A's run it more so just for a business, and they're like they're too aggressive, I think, with it. Yeah, and I and maybe the maybe the Red Sox gave you more of a a balance of that, and you, you see teams now, I think, having a little bit more balance. But he definitely mm-hmm. changed how. You know, they draft players, they change how you trade players and what you do with them. So I fucking love that movie. I think Billy Bean was just I'll fucking, watch it. I haven't w- watched w- it yet. was brilliant. Yeah, you should watch it. Yeah, I think you'll, it. You'll, it's a great movie no matter what. You know, this is a, this is the longest I think we've ever talked about. I know. I, you know what's so funny? <laughs> I keep apologizing because I yeah, know that you, yeah. I, I know that you don't like to talk. Oh, about Oh, I don't it very care. Much. I could talk about it. But I mean, I, if I, you talk specifics, I'm not gonna know what you're talking. Yeah, about. Yeah, well, that's what's tough. Like, and that's where I'd love to go deep. You know, what I'm yeah. saying I love to go deep in the game and stuff like that. But it's. Yeah, well, we'll keep I, doing this. We'll, we'll, we'll you know, yeah, we we'll start light. I mean, we 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 got him into Jesus not that long ago. We did. Now we're, <laughs> so fuck, uh, <laughs> next is sports. Yeah, you know, we're gonna change you, bro. No, no, Everybody no. thinks that Sal's influencing it's, us. It's happening the other way first around. First off, dude. it's not. <laughs> we're slowly fireproofing him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. gonna fireproof me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you watch sports? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so not to not changing gears because I don't want to talk about sports anymore. But I do want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But I do want to talk nah, about I, what we just watched. The Documentary, yeah. You just oh, yeah, we do. Well, we had magic that. pill. You had so many people that were reaching out asking us to watch this documentary. Which, by the way, I want to start by saying that it's a little slow. Mm. So, I think if you are looking for a documentary to buckle up and like gripping, yeah, it's, yeah, not, it's not like gripping, I think it's but... done okay. Um, a lo- it, I think it echoes a lot of our message that we've been saying for a long time. So, it's, it's just, not... it's so I mean, essentially, just a quick rundown. I mean, it's, it's showing how diet alone can solve a lot of uh, our health problems and they highlight a few people and situations in the in the documentary there's a there was a woman an older woman who was on like several different prescription medications and they had another woman who's you know asthmatic and then they were showing aboriginal tribes who were doing a 10 week retreat where they were going to eat a a more um, traditional aboriginal diet um, they had they showed a family with a daughter who was autistic and they were going to change her diet and it was just, I mean, it's, I get emotional watching it because I imagine how many people are suffering and the fix is really just changing their, just changing their lifestyle. Yeah. I, I mean, so many people, that's the fix. And, you know, one of the arguments, one of the things that they said in the, in the documentary, the family with the autistic girl and the dad's like, yeah, I don't know how we were going to do this because it's so much more expensive to eat this way. And what they did is they went largely ketogenic. They eliminated processed foods and, you know, they were seeing tremendous improvements in their daughter's health. 
And the dad was like, well, it's kind of expensive, so we're buying a whole cow. And he's talking about his strategies. And then, but before that, they were showing how much they were paying on her medications. Yep. And she was on this anti seizure drug that was $1,000 a bottle. And this is not unheard of, by the way. If you have chronic illness, you, you know how expensive medications can be, even if you have insurance. And so their insurance covered, you know, 70% of the cost. So he was yeah, $300 a month mm-hmm. on, this, on these pills. And then he's talking about how expensive it is to, he- it is to eat healthy. And, and my thought process is like, it's probably not. It's probably yeah. not more expensive. I don't think he put it apples to apples and like kind of really spreadsheeted it out because like there's no way. Like if all those medications, you know, you stack them up in the price point, there's no way you can you can see that. You can see how like just going organic and buying like good whole foods, you know, it's not even going to compare. That's it, my point. It, it can be though. I mean, we're also comparing to people that are all on fucking thousands of dollars of medication and then obviously they're saving tons of money. But to the average consumer, I've seen, I mean, I think Max did a really good post like how fucked up and uh, uh, backwards our society is when it's like a salad costs $13, but then you can get like yeah. four cheeseburgers from McDonald's for under $3 or whatever. But this is also why we partnered with a company like Thrive Market. I mean, that was what turned all of us on with this company was to be able to provide high quality source food like this instantly to your house for and make it cheaper and make it cheaper and this is why again like I love attaching ourselves to a company that one has got an incredible message doing great things as far as with how they give back mm. and then you know that this is the future man this is, is where we are yeah. heading in this direction where I mean, it's where you were watching the shift happen. Yeah, this- more people demand it, the price point gets down. Right. Yeah. I mean, and here and and look, here's the bottom line. Like, like we're relatively healthy people uh, in this room, and you know, most people in their 20s and 30s. Although, although it's getting worse for them too now, but for the you're not going to spend a ton of money on on medical stuff, but you keep living a life where you don't eat in a way that serves your body, and it will be more fucking expensive. A hundred percent. You look at the average cost that somebody spends the last five to ten years of their life, or how much people end up spending on medications when they hit once they hit the ages of fifty and sixty, and yeah, it's actually cheaper. It's actually much cheaper and you know less expensive to eat healthy. And besides, let's say it wasn't, uh, or you know, can you can you really quantify the the quality of life loss that you have because you're eating, you know, terribly? I mean, it's. Uh, it's it's insane to me now. As I'm watching this documentary, and and the documentary is very pro uh, ketogenic style diet, and they have lots of scientists uh, on there and researchers talking about why, you know, this is this is probably how humans ate uh, a lot of the times, you know, naturally, and how people tend to feel better when they eat this way, especially if they're already sick. Which I think, in the case of in the context of already being sick, you may feel better eating this way because your body's really lost its ability to utilize carbohydrates effect, you know, efficiently or effectively. So like if you have dementia, if you have, you know, chronic, uh, you know, autoimmune type disorders, I know lots of people uh, benefit from eating a higher, much higher fat, much lower carbohydrate type type diet. Um, So, you know, you're seeing a lot of that stuff in this documentary where they're kind of pushing that and promoting that. But my, my belief is that a lot of the benefits that people see when they eat that way, isn't necessarily because of the macronutrient profile. That I think that's part of it. I think it's because they just cut out all those processed foods. So mm-hmm. it's more like what they're not eating right. and, and less of what they are eating. I but, agree with that. But and now, now that being said, I was, I was looking at this, and I know the studies on, on carbohydrate intake, and I know if you want to be strong and explosive and you want to build muscle, you're probably better off eating some carbohydrates. And then I was thinking of the, in the context of uh, like human evolution, and for most of human history, you know, for most of it, the vast majority of it, like 90 something percent of it, carbohydrates were uh, harder to come by. Right, right. They just don't grow naturally. It's it, it, like if you, if you're a hunter gatherer, you're not going to run, you're not going to encounter a lot of carbohydrates. They, if, if you try to eat and, and cover your caloric needs. Nobody's ever been excited about like foraging to like, you know, keep things going. You, you're not going to have enough calories. No. It's just not going to be, and I'm not, this is pre-agricultural revolution before humans understood that they could actually grow food and, you know, plant things in particular ways. So if you're for, if you're, if you're a hunter gatherer, you may encounter fruit every once in a while or honey every once in a while, or maybe a tuber here or there, but you're, you're not going to eat very many carbs because there's not a lot around you. Now, think of the context of that in terms of 
what skills or what physical attributes did humans need a lot of more than any other during most of human civilization? Endurance. Stamina. Yep, stamina. More than any, more than anything yeah. else. Like uh, hunter gatherers, it's pretty well established that we probably and modern hunter gatherers do this do this now, so we can still observe them. But the way we hunted animals was we tracked them until they wore out. Until they wore out, and then we you know humans can throw with greater accuracy than any other animal, so we probably out we just wore them down and then fucking threw our spears at them and killed them. So strength and power and explosiveness and lots of muscle evolutionarily speaking, wasn't that big of an advantage. I mean, we were definitely strong and muscular, especially compared to the average, you know, out of shape, uh, you know, American, for example. But, you know, for stamina, is subsisting on lots of fats and low carbohydrates, is that a, a good strategy? Yeah, actually. Your, your body, even if you're lean, stores tens of thousands of calories worth of ketones in the form of stored body fat, even if you're lean. You'll have something like 30, 40,000 calories stored on your body that you can use if you're if you're in a situation where you're not eating and you need to track an animal down. Well, carbohydrates, you're lucky if you can store about 6,000 calories worth. Mm. So that'll run out very quickly. So in that context, because as I'm watching, I'm like, well, you know, but if you want to build muscle, if you want to be explosive, this and that, and yeah, they'll do that. But you know what? For humans are much more... I mean, we're kind of designed or evolved to really have more stamina than anything. And that comes from eating a diet that's more fat and, and way less you know, carbohydrates. And again, like what the documentary highlights is how beneficial that is for, you know, for people's health. And again, it's just, you know, how many people do you guys think if would go to the doctor if, if, if they just changed their lifestyle, if they, if they could just avoid all the- I think that's the biggest takeaway from that video. It's just showing that um, you know, like how powerful food is and how like our entire society still hasn't got that concept yet. So for any listener of this show, it's probably not very groundbreaking information, but what I like about it is it's, it's more of something that like it's on as it touches a lot of those topics and it's presenting it in a way that now I can sort of relay this to, like maybe a family member or somebody that's like, you know, not really ready to deep dive yet. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like the, I think the, the good one or the big one for me was, or something that I hear a lot from parents is, oh, my kid won't eat that. Oh, yes. My that's kid, a big yes, point. That was, my, a, that was a powerful scene. That's probably, as a trainer for 15 years, I don't think I've heard that more than, than anything else, which is just my kid won't eat it, refuses to eat it, won't eat this. And so I remember watching that and and going like, you know, okay, this is cool that they're going here because I think this is very common. What this this was the autistic kid and, you know, and, and they're that, not, you're not dealing with which, like your regular kid. Right, that makes it even harder, right? Yeah. It's not like, you know, it's one thing to have a normal kid who refuses to eat food, but imagine having an autistic kid that when you push a, fl a plate of chicken or something over to she throws it against the wall or mm. screams and cries or and, you know they showed video of her putting herself in the corner and throwing these crazy tantrums and I can't imagine how hard that would be for mm. a parent going through that and going like I just want the fucking kid to shut yeah. up here's your goldfish right. here's your fried you know chicken nuggets or whatever it is and so I, I get that so I thought that to me that was the most powerful part of the documentary was watching them progress through that and seeing the way she was reacting after they broke beyond the tent and weeks. how the kid was craving five this days. food it, after it took two weeks the breakthrough yeah two weeks later the kid was was eating the food that was put in front of her she was eating foods that were healthy <clears throat> and craving them and thriving as a result and here's my message to, to, to parents well first off you, you can't expect your kids to do something that you're not Okay, so that's number one. So if, if you're eating right. a shitty diet and then you're putting you get a model. healthy food to your kids, uh, well, good luck with that. That's a defeat. You're not going to win that. It's like trying to tell your kids not to smoke cigarettes, but you smoke right. all day long. Like, it doesn't work. Um, but here's number two. Stop being a fucking pussy, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, be a parent. Like, you, you know, like I think parents are so afraid yep. of their kids, of their kids not liking them or being upset that they just... You know, they just they, 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 they put, tuck their tail between their legs and give their kids whatever they want. Well, and think, it's like, it's fucking, listen. Get a cry closet in your house. Yeah, yeah. Your, your kid yeah, isn't yeah, yeah. going to starve. Like, yeah. are there going to be a few days where they don't need a lot? That's the point, though. Yeah. That's the point people need to understand. They can go a couple days. If they're going to throw a tire, you know, a little hissy fit about it, guess what? Like, they're 
they're gonna get hungry at some point. <laughs> yeah, they will. You know, they're gonna subside. They're gonna they're gonna try it because they're so hungry. You know, it's like they could fight you all they want, but at the end of the day, their body's gonna want to feed. Yes, and here's what I see. Okay, because I think some parents see it and they think, oh, my my kid's just being a brat. They're throwing a tantrum. And they just want to eat their, you know, their, their their crackers or whatever, and they don't want to eat what I'm putting in front of them. And they're acting crazy, and they're acting like brats, and they're acting, uh, you know, like disrespectful. Here's what I see. What you know, what it looks like to me: withdrawal. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You take away alcohol from an alcoholic, or you take away heroin from a heroin addict, you're going to see the same type of behavior. And that's what's happening. It's not that your kids are brats. Your kids are literally going through withdrawal. They become dependent. Yep. They become dependent on these processed sugary foods for sure. 100%. And they get and they cry and they don't feel, and they don't like oh, it. Yeah. And it. It's a hard process for them. There's no denying that. Dude, I've seen it's it's just last night my 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 son's volleyball team had a like a, a party at the end of the season. So, you know, everybody was together and they were, you know, they're having pizza and whatever and I brought my daughter and at the end of it they give a cake to the coach. And uh, it's a big ass cake, and I'm and the and the lady who's serving the cake is giving the cake out to the kids, and then my daughter's up next in line, and she looks at my daughter, and she's like, "Do you like a lot of frosting or a little bit of frosting?" And I'm looking at the cake, I'm like, "The whole thing's covered in frosting, okay?" But thanks for asking my daughter a stupid question. We all know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> so, and I, you know, I'm surrounded by parents, right? So I'm and I'm very careful about how I come across to other people and mm. also to my daughter in front of her friends in front of other people because it could backfire, right? If I come across- Yeah, you don't the, want to be that dad. I don't want to be the tyrant, yeah. right? And I don't want to- That dad that no, nobody wants to go to his house yeah. because- Well, no, I don't <laughs> want to be a tyrant to my daughter either. I don't want her to have a bad you know, relationship with food because dad's looking over my shoulder. So I'm just observing. So I'm watching this and, and of course my daughter's like, I like a lot of frosting. And she gives, and you guys can't see this on the, on the, on the podcast, unfortunately, but this is how big of a piece- so gave my daughter. He's, he's showing about a, a softball and a half size, and it's like and it's like thick. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. they give that to my daughter, and I'm looking at this mom like, that's that's four pieces for an adult. Wow! You just gave my eight year old daughter a massive piece of very very highly palatable addictive food. Like, yeah. okay, so let's watch and see what happens. Now, luckily, my kids don't eat a lot of sugar, so I feel like okay, maybe palate fatigue will kick in. Make her feel nauseous. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it did. She got through about a third of it and she left it. And I'm like, oh, you don't want to eat anymore? She's like, no, I think I'm done. And then, of course, she was acting kind of funny later on and I could tell what was going on. And so I tried to connect that. And I said, oh, I said, do, you, do you feel kind of nauseous a little bit? And she's like, yeah. And I said, it might be because you ate too much of that cake, too much sugar does this, that, and the other. And, I, and then I left it alone. But people, parents just... They don't either. They don't know. Do you or know they're, they're, you, they're so scared. Funny. Do you know how wimps. important that, that piece though is? Right there, what you just said was, you know, being a, being aware first of all that you don't want to be the dad that knocks the cake out of her hand or says you can't have that, but helping her make the connections of her not feeling good, whether it be she's cranky, whether she's irritable, or her stomach isn't feeling good, or she has headaches, or she can't, whatever that is. As a parent, you know, is. Almost giving them that little bit of freedom to where the kid can make that choice. So you're empowering her by doing that, mm -hmm. but then also helping her connect the dots on potentially how that makes her feel and then educating her along the way. And then I know some people listening right now don't have the level of education you do, but I also don't think that you get into really deep science with her. I think you can keep it very simple mm -hmm. for her. To I understand. just explain it in, in, in a way that she can understand. I don't talk to her like she's a baby. So I make sure that I do talk to her like she's a little older than she is. But what you you would be surprised at how much more kids uh, understand than you think. You know what I mean? It's so funny you brought this up because um, you know little league they they do treats and stuff too, and this is still like a battle, you know, that I have. But um, I wasn't there. We were in Austin, and and my kids had a game, and Courtney was there um, for the game, and and she was telling me about <laughs> this story. She she saw that they had these huge Rice Krispie treats with like you know chocolate and everything else in them and all this stuff with like Capri Suns and that's what like they, they got for a snack you know like this is like right before dinner again and so she just saw that and like saw it. and she just like my wife has no filter at all that's probably why I married her but like she just was like she's like oh come on like you, we're gonna give these kids you know all this sugar right but after, after they did all this like awesome exercise and we're gonna go try and feed them like a healthy dinner after this whose idea was this like like ranting about it 
and the per- and the, the lady was right behind her and was like, "Oh, I just thought you know they'd like it and this and that." <laughs> and I was of like, course oh, they'll ooh. like it. Yeah. Like, well, so ooh. like, and she's just like, whatever. Like, was this just she doesn't care? Day? I would have been like, "Oh God!" Like, you know, yeah. This is, this is like over the weekend, so. But it's but that's the mindset though. The mindset is that we're catering into like what these kids like. It's like it's it's that association of like celebration or you know whatever the fuck we we attach to like birthdays parties this and that like we we give them shit and and it's like nobody nobody's put that together it's like why can't we give them something else i'm fully convinced fully convinced that you know forget dieting forget following this following that diet and doing watching your cow i'm fully convinced if the average person just eliminated processed food that's it if you just cut out highly processed foods you would notice a significant improvement in health you you would lose some body fat and you'd feel a lot better. Now, are you going to be ripped? Or are you going to be shredded? Are you be, probably not, because at that point, you need to then also monitor things like calories and stuff like that. But most people, if they just did that alone, would notice significant changes in the way they looked and felt. And there's for two reasons. One of the main reasons is, and I've said this so many times, but I don't care, I'm going to keep saying it, is processed foods are designed specifically to make you overeat. Now, it's not some conspiracy theory. This isn't some like evil you know, scientist in a laboratory is like, how can I make people well, fat? Well, it kind of is. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. It kind of is, actually. Well, <laughs> it's, they're, just, they're just trying to sell more. Yeah. And, you're, and they know when they make Get something- profits up. They know when they make something taste ridiculously good, people eat more. And so there's no, of course, you're going to overeat when you eat these processed foods. And then the other thing is what these foods are comprised of, well, it's, it's stuff that doesn't make your body operate well. And so if you just eliminate that alone, you know, watch what happens. Watch what happens to your kids. I notice a significant change in my kids when they spend too much time at, at their grandparents' house. And, you know, God bless their grandparents because they've got wonderful, loving grandparents. But it is a, oh, let me tell you, it's an uphill battle because I'll go, they'll be at my, you know, my parents' house or my in-law's house and I'll go over, you know, my ex-in-law's house and I'll go there and and I'll see what they're giving them to eat and you know, my but you know, my kid will be sitting on the on the on the couch and they'll be watching cartoons or whatever, and they'll just have a large bag of some kind of processed snack. Like it's not even portioned out. It's just like, here's the bag, eat until you want to stop eating, you know. And so not only are you distracted from watching something, but now you're eating this, you know. And it's like, oh man, how do yeah. I? And you try to talk to the, you know, I don't know how you are with your with your parents, but I oh, talk to man. them about it, and it's like. They feel like they're being ridiculed. Yeah. Like, I'm the grandfather. I'm the grandma. That's my job to spoil them. I'm like, yeah, no, that, it's not your job to fucking ruin this kids. This is some <laughs> old, yeah, this is some old, I don't know where that came from, but it is shared by pretty much everybody like, <laughs> in that generation. And I don't know, like, you know, if it was coming back from, you know, the war or something or like, you know, like the scarcity mindset was still like there from previous like depression era people that passed that on but you know we got to fucking break the chain and it, it it is one of those things that like it it fires me up sometimes because like i i feel like powerless because you just they do such a good job mm-hmm. with 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 taking them um you know loving them and like doing activities with them and being active and the, and then they'll go to like McDonald's and, and and treat it with like uh, some apple pie and it's tough, dude. Our culture it fucking kills me. Our culture has been celebrating food for a long time. You know what I'm saying? It, we've been celebrating it for a really long time. It's a tough. I think it's a very tough thing, and we're right in the middle of it, right? So I think the generation coming up, I think we'll be. T- Sal and I were talking in the bathroom just earlier that I think that you know your guys' as kids generation when they have kids, they'll get it, they'll get it yep. because there'll be enough information studies that it right now we are in the you know 70s of smoking cigarettes oh, it's the, it does look a lot like the cigarette yeah it is it, rem- it reminds yeah. me a lot about that and, and there's that and there's still people that fucking smoke daily sure. i don't think there'll ever be people that won't be drinking poison and eating shit for it looks like a deliberate you know, like ah, right. fuck health like, R- ah. right 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 yeah. that's what like, it looks like yeah, that's now. what it looks like to everybody right so I think that when when it starts to get that stigma, and I think we're watching that, I think uh, that the pendulum is starting to swing back, but we're still way on the other side. I mean, we're, we're nowhere near getting back to like centered. I think we're still on the very extreme side, and I think we'll eventually come back. Well, so way. here's something cool, um, and you know, I don't know if you started to, Justin, I don't know if you started to like give your kids time blocks for electronics like we had talked about yep. or whatever. Mm-hmm. 
So, so here's something interesting that I'm gonna start doing. So, a couple things that I've noticed now, my kids, both kids have four hours total of electronic time for the week during the week total. Yeah. Damn, and that's not a lot, bro. I know that's not it, a lot. At all. That, now that doesn't include mm. that doesn't include four hours it, total for a week for a whole week. That mm. is not a lot of time. Yeah. No, well, I could play. I used to play video games for two, three hours straight. In I know. One, well, one yeah. I know. That's where it is. That's yeah. that's where that's where we're starting, and then we're gonna see what it looks like. But so far, here's what I've noticed. So far. And by the way, that doesn't include when you need to use electronics for schoolwork. Mm. So if you have to go on your computer to ride, whatever, I'm not gonna, of course, I'm not going to cut into that. But four hours total, that includes TV uh, and internet and video game usage. Yeah, that's, a, that's crazy. So here's what I've noticed. I got I've, a lot to contribute to yeah, this. Here's what I've know. noticed. Be, since doing this, first off, my kids are way more personable. They're, they play together better. Um, they're, uh, they're more creative. They're more hardworking, so when they're doing their chores or whatever, like they're on it. Um, and here's the other thing that I've noticed that I didn't even think about. One of the greatest things you can teach your kids is how to uh, sacrifice for something that they want, how to like save money or save whatever for something that they want in the future. That's a great skill to have. In fact, scientists will, will tell you that a child who does that very well tends to grow up to be a successful adult. Your ability to not always grab what's expedient and to study hard and it's going to be tough for later on, you know, benefits and all that stuff. Like that's a, that's a good skill. And that's something you want to teach in your kids. I love watching what my kids are doing now with their time because the four hours is up to them. I don't say that I, they can do it all in one day if they want, but that's it. Right? Right, right. So I'm watching how they're doing it. Now my daughter is different than my son. And what my daughter will do is she'll be like, okay, she'll be like, Papa, I'm going to use uh, 15 minutes of my time. So make sure you, you know, whatever. And so she used 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, 20 minutes there. And she's just monitoring her total and keeping track of it. My son will go zero time all the way until he gets to the weekend. That's what I would do. When he can sit that's down. That's what I would do. <laughs> Muck yeah. out with my friends. He's a lot like his dad. That's what I, that's <laughs> yeah, what I do. Yeah. That's how I party too. If I, I like, won't drink and then I'll go out and go nuts. So he's doing the same. So that's what he do. He'll save it all. And then Saturday he'll just like for three hours in a row, he'll play video games with his friends and that's what he that's how he enjoys to do it and that's fine but it's teaching them that skill mm -hmm. and watching and observing is really really cool but here's the thing I'm going to try now with with uh, with processed foods and stuff like that so I don't I don't treat processed foods like they're uh like they're you know total poison and I don't I don't I'm not this super crazy tyrant I'm always trying to balance, play that balancing act cuz my kids still have to live in this world right and so I don't want to create that kind of relationship with food where they rebel they go off to college or they're like, oh, my dad was so oppressive with food. Now I'm just going to eat whatever I want type of deal because you can do that or create an eating disorder or something. Like, right? So I don't want to do any of that stuff. So every once in a while, special events, like I, I'll buy them these types of things. I want them to know that it's okay every once in a while. It's not this evil thing, but it's probably better if we don't have it most of the time. Like the movies. Like when we go to the movies, I always get my kids a small popcorn. It's just something we do. But what I'm going to start doing now, because I've noticed how they're so good with managing their, their electronic time, is when we go to the movies... I'll say, okay, kids, you know, I'm going to get you your popcorn or I'm going to give you an extra 30 minutes of electronic time if you don't get the popcorn. And I'm going to let them start to play with that trade. And so, Now, that's up to me, of course, how much time I'll give them for whatever. Mm -hmm. That's just an example. But I want to see – I want them to start to, you know, prioritize things that they want more than the other and just learn that skill. And so I'm I, I, something I thought about this morning. That's, that's interesting. interesting. That's really interesting. I like that. Yeah, I, we've, we've uh, implemented a whole new – um, idea as well, which um, is is somewhat based off of like that sort of a reward thing, but also like you earn it. So we have a board that I've actually taken like, so my kids have, have done certain chores and like they can earn a certain amount of money for whatever they're doing. And I've already kind of established some kind of like an economy with that, you know, like, okay, this equates to this. And like, just on a real small level of like, you know, real tough tasks, you know. Like, you, you mean like the trash is a dollar. Yeah. And if I do dishes after t it's yes. seven dollars. And if you mow the lawn, that's ten dollars. Exactly. Like, okay, cool. Exactly. So they, like underst that. they understand that already that each one carries a little more weight. And we have, too, been monitoring a lot of their electronic time as well. Um, but so what I've done that's been a little bit more powerful is actually taking that the cash of that money and then put it in like the different slots for the different activities. So they actually like see it as they walk upstairs, Brilliant. they see the cash, 
and then they just get self motivated to work towards that cash, and then that cash can pay for like like you said like more electronic time. Mm. Or you know, like Ooh, that's kind like of cool. like Legos. Ooh, I like that or dude. whatever. So. Dude, those are skills. Those are so valuable because a lot of kids don't have those skills because whatever they want, they get right in front of them. And so then in the real world, you know, if dude, how, what a brilliant idea! Justin. Very smart. Yeah, no, you. So they have to. They would have to now purchase their yeah their time. They purchase just like any other economy that we're which part is such of, right? a, such a great lesson because as an adult, if you did want to muck out on that's video how games, you'd have to do you'd it. have to buy it. You know what I'm saying? You had to buy it, and you'd have to sacrifice working and making more money for that time, and you'd have to find a balance, or else you'd be broke because you can't just spend money all the time and not work for that. So yeah. what a great fucking it, way to it, teach that lesson when, when your kids start to identify with with that or understand that you start to see it in other behaviors. Like, you know, one thing that I always since birth with my kids that I try to, to, uh, you know, to instill in them is the value of hard work Mm -hmm. and how, and over talent, over anything. Like I rarely ever tell my kids you're super smart, you're super talented, whatever. Not because I don't think that they are, or I don't think they have any talents, but because I want them to, I want them to value the hard work that went into it instead of the natural ability. So like my son's super good at math. Like he's and and you know, he scores really, really high in academics. I, I don't sit down and tell him, Hey, you're 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 brilliant. In fact, what I tip tend to do is I sit down with them and I say, Hey, look, a lot of these things come e- easy to you. So you're gonna you're gonna need to figure out how to challenge yourself and push yourself because you're gonna do better than a lot of other kids just and it's easy. And so what the crazy thing is last night Again, because the electronic thing, right? It's like seven o'clock or seven thirty at night, and you know the kids are up for another couple hours or whatever, and we're sitting around, and you know my 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 son's like, hey, can we watch a movie together? Because it doesn't count on the time if we all do it as a family. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, no, you know, I don't really. I'm probably gonna go to bed early tonight, and I need to do some work. So sorry, I'm not gonna be able to watch TV with you. But you can go if you want to read or whatever. It's up to you. So he looks at me and he goes, you know what I'm gonna do? He goes, I'm gonna go upstairs and do. Uh, we have this. They have they have this weekly homework that they're supposed to do. And studying, he's like, I'm gonna go up and do that, and I'm like, what? Like, he's voluntarily <laughs> choosing to do that. Yeah. So I go upstairs, you know, after about an after about 30 minutes or so, and he's doing it still. And I'm like, why are you? Why'd you choose to do this instead of, you know, reading your books and stuff like that? And he goes, well, he goes, I have the time. He goes, I, I think I'm gonna do this because I like, uh, you, you know, I like getting good grades, and this this is something I want to work towards. He goes, well, after about another 20 minutes, I think I'll start reading. I didn't say anything else. I just left. But to see it in action, to see that your kid starts to make those decisions and what you're doing is working, because sometimes it's, I'll tell you, man, it's hard as a parent, dude, because nobody wants, you don't want your kids to hate you. And let me tell you something right now, as a divorced father- that's it's an even more pressure. Way harder. Right. All Especially I, if mom is on the other side feeding them crap, letting them play video games whenever they want. Or, Dad's or, the asshole. And the good news is, for the yeah. most part, we work together really well, me and my ex. But really, here's what it comes down to. You know, we got divorced. There's a lot of there's a lot of guilt that goes through your mind as a parent when you do that because it's tough for the kids. It's very tough. No matter how great you make it, it's going to be hard. You got to change homes. You got to, you know, mom, dad's not living at home anymore. It's a lot of different things. All I want to do is make my kids like me. I just want to make life nice for them. So you know how hard it is to like tell my kids you can't do something or to kind of, yeah. you know, be a parent. It's very very hard. Very difficult thing to do. But then when you see the behaviors. You know, it's like okay, man, and and you know, and your kids thrive on it. It's not. Here's the thing, like you, they call it spoiling your kids for a reason. You're you're lit. It's like spoiling fruit or spoiling food. You're making your kid bad. Yeah. Like they're not going to be a great. They're not going to be as as as, as fruitful in a, an adult as as fulfilled as an adult as it can be if you are afraid of laying down the law. Sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes and food is one of those things. And parents are fucking run ragged by their kids you know how many times i'd have parents tell me oh my oh you know i want to feed my kids you know vegetables but they just won't eat it and all they want to eat is chicken nuggets and pasta so that's all we give them otherwise they won't eat it's like actually i'd like to test that theory i'd like for your kid to come live with me for a week and we'll see if they starve themselves to death yeah. if i don't give them chicken nuggets <laughs> and pasta i highly 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 it's not doubt gonna it. happen right. not gonna happen this quaz brought to you by organifi For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory-tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk-free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. Our first question is from Beth Leanne. 
tips on staying on track with your diet when your partner buys snacks and treats for you and always wants to eat out? You know what? So this is just you and your partner. Um, Well, I hate to tell you this, but you are responsible for yourself. Right. And that's pretty much it, you know? Um, Well, you just have to to evaluate... how important that is, you know, and, and this is, uh, this is, in my opinion, part of, you know, as, as you get older and you date um, lots of different people, a lot of that isn't like you figuring out the, the person that you want. It's more about you figuring out what's important to you and, and, and your value system. And, you know, something that I didn't piece together, even being a trainer, like I was a trainer, but it, it wasn't necessary that I had a girl that was a trainer or in the health and fitness space or hardcore into working out and dieting. So I dated a lot of really awesome chicks that, you know, were pretty and, you know, took decent care of themselves, but also didn't value, you know, eating really good or making sacrifice to, for, to be healthy. Uh, they just didn't care about that stuff as much. And, you know, it kind of it, it wore on me a little bit, but it wasn't like a game like, oh, I'm going to be I'm done with this girl because she likes to eat too much pasta. Like it wasn't like that. But what I realized after every relationship when I'd be, be single again is the one of the things I love to do is to take care of myself and train and eat correctly and do that. And I started to piece it together after and it took a while of relationships before I realized like. I want to partner that this is important because it's so important to me because I'm not fully loving myself when I'm not taking care of myself, like as far as food choices and things like that. And so, and I'll be the first to admit that I need help. I was raised in a home that I was able to eat all those things. So I battle with my own desires and wanting to say, ah, fuck it, just go eat all, eat whatever. And I know better. So I also want a partner who has similar goals in that area because I know that I'm not going to be perfect all the time. And if I have somebody who's constantly pulling me towards the snacks, the candies, the eating out all the time, I, I know that I'll probably eventually give into that more than I'd like to. And then I end up resenting myself because I don't like the way I look and feel. And so really this is about you and your values. Now, that may not be you. You may not feel like you need a partner who is cares about health the same way you do and you have the discipline to do what you need to do regardless of what they do, kind of what Sal was saying, like this is on you. So it's either on you to make the right choices or it's on you to figure out if this is something that's important that you find in your partner. So yeah. Yeah. a lot of reflection time. Well, right and you here. just really have to communicate uh, that it's important with your partner. And I think that uh, a lot of times... Um, you you know you're on separate paths and um it, it doesn't really get discussed a lot like i'm i'm really trying to do this and i want you to come on board but like there's no real conversation that's like you know this is really important to me and like right. these are things that um you i know, value i value and and i want you to support me in this and like really just like lay it down and be like this is this is something that i'm trying to do i would really like you to support me in this yeah you know it's like if you don't have that conversation they're not going to understand that right Right. you you know when this becomes a problem it becomes a problem when two people meet and they start dating and then one of them starts to figure out eating you know healthy and starts to take care of themselves and so that's when it really becomes a problem because rare i think it's more rare to see somebody who's really into health and wellness, date someone who's not right out the gates. You know what I mean? Like, that's not typically, true. I, I did a lot. It's I, more rare. It's I, not I, as it's not as common. You know what I'm saying? I, like, I think it depends on where you're at in your life. Like, yeah. if, I don't know who this person is in their profile, and if they're before 30 years old, it's way common. I think that's less common as a 35, 38, 39 year old man to go find a woman that's like, if we were all single now, right? If we were all single and on the dating market, right, and swiping left. Then we literally would not <laughs> all day pick somebody who's not in that because we know ourselves because we know how important it is. So yeah. we, we wouldn't even gravitate towards a person that didn't have similar values. Mm-hmm. Now, when you're in your twenties and everybody looks decent, yeah. even when they eat shitty food, you know what I'm saying, or have bad choices or bad habits. Like, I mean, I did a lot of like modeled like chicks that like ate literally jack in the box and carrots. Like that's yeah. what they had, yeah. and they looked awesome. I mean, awesome yeah. enough to make magazines and do things but like that's that. That's what I mean. It's not really a problem. Um, it, it, it's not really a problem until one person, you know, realizes it's super important to them. Is, is basically my point. And you, I mean, you're right. If someone's in their 20s and they're really kind of eating right and what, it's more rare to find someone in their 20s who's really into health and wellness. More, uh, it's more common rare. to find someone in their 20s who eats a particular way to look a particular way. Like I get that. Like in my 20s, look, here's the deal. 
I ate a particular way, but it wasn't for health and wellness. It was because I wanted to look buffed. Mm-hmm. I really didn't care about the other stuff. And so my choices weren't necessarily driven by, right, right. by health. So that's, I think, when it becomes a problem. When it becomes a big problem is when you have a partner that you have a child with. Now there's a big problem because now how do we feed the kid? Your value system is different. Yeah. How do we feed the kid now? Because it's one thing for you to feed yourself a particular way and you don't want to take care of yourself and maybe I've accepted that and whatever. But when it comes to a child that's also my kid, now this may be an issue because I think they need to eat a particular way for their health and you don't think it's that important and I feel like you're harming the kid. That That's when it can become a problem. But- at the end of the day, here's the deal. Uh, who is it more of a bigger who who's a more of a, a pain in the ass? The person who doesn't eat healthy and just buys lots of snacks, or the pe- person who eats healthy and won't eat all those snacks? The reality is, you're probably a bigger pain in the ass than the other person, and that's okay. My point is, don't give in. Like, if they buy a bunch of food and want to eat out, and you're like, no, I don't want to eat there because it's not really that healthy. You know, maybe they'll get the maybe if they really want to be with you, they'll be like, okay, fine, we'll eat out somewhere that I know you'll want to eat. Look. A lot of people, a lot of my friends and family think I'm a pain in the ass because of that. I I can't tell you how many times people will throw a party and then they'll be like, well, what's Sal going to eat? Because they know I'm not going to eat the the Domino's pizza and the the cupcakes. And so many times I'll tell them, well, don't worry, I won't eat anything. I'm fine. And then they feel guilty and they're like, well, we'll make some, you know, something else for you or whatever. Here's some mineral water. Yeah, just kind of, you know. (laughs) Oh, dude! It's a double like, chico, like, like, bro. Demeaning you. Yeah. It's so funny. We, we, you know, Jessica and I went to uh, her friend's kid's birthday party, and there wasn't anything there that I really could eat or wanted to eat. Right, so people were coming up to be like, "Hey, how come you're not eating any food and whatever?" And I could tell they're taking it personal. And so it's like it's hard to explain to them why without them taking it personal. Oh, yeah. So I'm just telling them like, I, and usually what I'll say to people if I want to lie just to get out of it or whatever, mm-hmm. is I'll say, "Oh, I have an intolerance to that food," or "I have a bad stomach right now." People usually leave me alone when I say something like that. Yeah. No, nobody will feed you if you tell me you have diarrhea. Listen, yeah. yeah. Trust me. <laughs> it's coming out hot yeah. if I but, eat that. But yeah, it's you know here's the thing like you got to decide how important it is to you that your partner, especially if it's a you know, it's it's tough when you have a partner and you can see and witness their their poor health. So besides the aesthetics, like, yeah, if they're getting overweight and you're pretty fit, I mean, you're not attracted to anymore to them anymore. Like, I get that. But when you notice that they're, like, more lazy or their moods are shifting a lot and you know, like, oh, man, it's because you're not eating really healthy, you know, you got to decide how important it is to you because if this is a very important thing to you, like if you're a Christian and it's super important, your religion is real important to you. It might be hard for you to date a an atheist or a you know a Satan worshiper. You know, so <laughs> so if you're really really healthy, it's like and, cupcakes or, or broccoli. Yeah. It's, it's, Satan. It's, it's nutrition is like yeah. religion. It's, yeah. Well, I mean that's the thing. Like if it's super important to you and they're the opposite of that, you might you might you might not last very long. You might want to talk to them about it. Uh, but otherwise, just just worry about yourself. Just do your thing. And either they'll come along and, and, and follow you or you'll start to get sick of them and, you know, maybe it won't work out. Next question is from Naturally Brittany. I'm 24 weeks pregnant and I've been lifting weights the entire pregnancy with plans to continue through to the end. My question is, should I be concerned about my recruitment patterns changing as my belly and body is drastically changing? If so, what would you recommend? Do recruitment patterns change as your your baby grows and your belly grows? Absolutely. Yeah, of course they do. It's supposed to. Yeah. So recruitment patterns are, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give you a real general explanation. This is how your muscles fire. Which ones fire harder? The, the you know, which ones fire first? Which ones stay fired? Which ones relax? And that's what gives you your movement. Well, when your baby's growing, your abs and your obliques and your transverse abdominis, they stretch out. Stretched way out. And, and your hip flexors actually start to support you a lot more. And that's normal. And there's nothing wrong with changing recruitment patterns. The reason why they change is they, they're changing in a way to make you better at what you do a lot of. So if you ride a bike a lot, if you run a lot, if you sit a lot, if you're pregnant, your recruitment patterns will change to make you more efficient at that particular, you know, whatever it is you're doing a lot of. Um, the problem or the challenge becomes after you have the baby because now you have an old recruitment pattern that benefited you while you were pregnant um, and you had a you know big belly and now 
your your belly goes down and you're not pregnant anymore, but you've got this old pattern. So what you need to do is you need to train the pattern to be now more beneficial towards your body the way it is now. And one of the most effective exercises you can do for uh, post pregnancy for that is the is vacuums. Vacuum, yeah. Vacuum poses. What a great exercise. The other one too is, um, and we have videos of this. Maybe we'll put it in the show notes. There's, so we have video for vacuum. We also have That's a video the wall for- wall test as well. Yeah, wall test. And then also um, you know, the, the hip flexor deactivator crunches yep. that I showed on that video that one time to get people to activate- you know, their core, We've which been, seems, we, it seems very hard, you know, like I know my wife went through this whole process too. It was like inactive at all. Like she couldn't really like even feel anything for a long time in her abs and, uh, it, it turned off. Yeah. It gets, it gets frustrating, but it literally takes like super consistent reps and just like day after day of, of really focusing and trying to localize that area to, to activate again. And, and then sure enough, you know, once you get it to respond, you know, things start to kind of go back to, uh, you know, the way they were. What did we ever do with that uh, pregnancy suit and wig that we <laughs> had? We I burned that. it, dude. You guys are going to make me wear it. We, we, never, do, we never used that. We don't we? have it? We don't have it anymore? Justin? I, no, we should still have it in the... Uh, up in the loft there. Really? Yeah. I, I. We should do that. We need to do that. Pregnancy series? Yeah, we were going to do a whole pregnancy series. We're going to put Justin in a pregnancy suit and give him a wig. Yeah. yeah the, Why Justin? <laughs> he's, got the, he's got the best cakes. Uh, <laughs> look, I got some, yeah. some good hips for yeah. birthing. I don't know. Yeah. Have you, got, you guys have trained a lot of pregnant women. Yeah, right? all the yeah. way up until the day they pop, man. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think it's one of the uh, probably um, silliest things that I'd hear doctors like tell... <laughs> tell their uh their patients right that they oh you shouldn't exercise don't do this don't do that i'm like oh you're already telling people that are looking for excuses not to do fucking shit and then you it's like it's so easy yeah. and it, you know it's tough for me to sit by i got family members my sister right now who just had a baby and the same thing like they basically prescribe being in bed to her yeah. you know what i'm saying i'm like well some cultures they do that they it's like you're on bed rest like you can't move like it's, it's interesting it's and then you see the other extreme of that you have like a you know our our girl grace that's in our forum posting videos of her training doing pull-ups and yeah just yeah, savage yeah. dude and look how amazing she dude, the looks. bounce back and the turnover it, it, it it's so oh. amazing to watch oh, you know when God. you when you keep in maintain fitness levels going in and the pregnancy what is grace she's on what two or three she's on three kids i think she has maybe yeah maybe and two. her body looks bad yeah. dude you wouldn't even know unless she had a kid just literally like and it was like before. there was a video she posted in the forum where it was like i don't know weeks after and she yeah. was like working out and you're like you can't tell she just had a baby yeah. i had the contrast between the clients that I would that I trained who would work out before, during, and after pregnancy, uh, them versus people who don't do that, the difference is dramatic, like massive in terms of uh, how they felt during their pregnancy. So less back pain, less discomfort, mm -hmm. they more energy, they felt better, and the uh, the, the their health post pregnancy like how they felt afterwards and how quickly they bounce back to feeling really, really good. Balances out hormones uh, better. better. It's actually better for the baby. Baby's actually born a little bit leaner. They're now showing that uh, there's some studies that suggest, and there's nothing concrete, but I definitely would place my money at that this is the case, that women who exercise before, during, and after, uh, their baby's um, IQs are higher. There's actually some studies that suggest that that may actually be the case. It's just better health. I think resistance training is the best form of exercise for pregnant women. I think it's the best form of exercise for a lot of people, but especially for pregnant women, because resistance training is so moldable. Like, you know, if you're a runner, you know, at some point you got to stop running if you can't run with weights, man, I can, I can, I can apply weights to, I've had paraplegics come in and oh, I yeah, train me them, too. Yeah. you know, yeah. you can modify and mold resistance training for pretty much anybody. And so if you're pregnant and you find like, oh, I can't do that exercise anymore, modify it. Or I can't yeah, do that one. be something you can do. Yeah, yeah, modify that. And, and you'll find that you're, you're, you'll be able to work out even if, you know, regardless uh, of, you know, how your body's feeling. And then post-pregnancy, you know, all the, the, you know, strengthening of the hips. So the two areas that I would always focus on with pregnant, with pregnant women post-pregnancy after they had their child when they were cleared was, strengthening the transverse abdominis and the core just because that was you know inactive 
um, when the, while they're pregnant, and then hips because they get you, you start to notice hip dysfunction sometimes just because they've had to push a baby out, and right. those those areas tend to loosen up anyway. And so I will do lots of hip exercises and stuff, strengthening. So 90-90 and connecting to the different positions in 90-90 would also be good uh, post-pregnancy. Uh, but I, shit, man, I, used to, I got known for this, especially when I had my studio, uh, my, my wellness studio, is the my clients would have their babies and then they bring their babies in and I would train them with their kids because it was my place. So, you know, babies were were welcome. And many times I would hold the babies and play with them while the mom would work out or we'd use the baby as resistance. So if the mom was doing an overhead press and the baby was getting a little fussy or whatever, so we'd have fun and the, she'd you know do overhead presses with the baby and focus on her her posture or her form, or she would do a, a, you know variations of crunches with the baby on her on her chest and do that kind of stuff. And so it was kind of fun and they enjoyed it. And it, for me, it was good for business because they didn't stop working out and they continued coming. And I developed this great relationship with these people. In fact, some of these kids call me Uncle Sal to this day, which is pretty funny. Yeah, because they were in my gym while they were in their mom's womb and afterwards. But um, yeah, your your recruitment patterns do change. The right kind of training post pregnancy will get them right back to where you want them to be. Our next question is from D Break Three. If my strength keeps increasing while I'm following Maps Anabolic, does that mean my metabolism is also speeding up? You're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> that's what happens, man. That's yeah. what's awesome when you're following a great program, right? Yeah, yeah. You start to build muscle, metabolism kicks up. I, I would feed say, the beast. I would say strength gains are a pretty good sign that your metabolic rate is increasing. I don't think it's a hundred percent guaranteed, but I don't know. Can you guys think of a more clear sign than that? Like, if I have a client who's, you know, trying to get leaner and they're losing body fat and they're getting stronger. Typically, I'm like, oh, cool. Your metabolism is not necessarily adapting to slow down, right? Because well, I also gonna... say we're in a very. I always say we're in a nice sweet spot too. I mean, that's where you want to be. You want to be in this place where you can actually see yourself reducing body fat, which is hard, right? To be in a place where you see your waistline coming down, and then you actually see strength going up. That's that. You are there. You're in the yeah. sweet spot because if you if you cut too many calories, a really good sign that you're cutting too much calories is you see a decrease in strength pretty mm-hmm. rapidly afterwards. Even if you see mm-hmm. the weight loss or the fat loss like you want, many times people over overdo it and they cut so much or they overtrain to lose the body fat. And one of the first signals of that is that you start to lose strength. So somebody who is losing body fat, right? And their metabolism speeding up and they see their waistline going down and you see strength going. I mean, you're in the, you're in that yeah, sweet yeah. spot, man. You, you've honed in on the holy grail. Right. Yeah, right. Just keep strength, driving forward. Strength gains are one of my is my favorite easiest signal to read with people. Like if I have somebody who says uh, you know, I have um HP axis dysfunction where the hormones are kind of off or if I have a guy who's you know, Does any client really say that? HP, well, I'm yeah, using the right HPA terminology. HPA axis dysfunction. Yeah, I never had something that. Um, I get people like that, I, you know, yeah. probably because I talk about it on the yeah. podcast. <laughs> but, you know, whatever, uh, adrenal fatigue, slow metabolism, you know, like, you know, my hormones are off. And when, I, when their strength starts to go up, like, I know, like, okay, we're definitely on the, the right track. Now, you know what's funny about this whole metabolism speeding up thing, because we talk about it so much, about getting your metabolism faster. I also want people to know that just speeding up your metabolism isn't necessarily a good or great thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing either. It's just in the context of modern life, you're probably better off with the metabolism that burns more calories, right? Because mm-hmm. you're not going to be moving as much. It's, you know, Modern life is sedentary. You're surrounded by all this food all the time, hyperpalatable food. Well, you've brought up that example a few times with that tribe that, um, yeah, they basically had a slow metabolism. They didn't burn as many calories as like uh, people that were studying them thought mm-hmm. because it wasn't advantageous towards them, you know, going on these miles to find food and to, to hunt and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, the Hadza tribe, the H A D Z A, I think it is. You can actually look this up. But what they did is they, they, through pretty sophisticated means, tested their metabolic rates. And these are modern hunter-gatherers. And they thought, oh, they're going to be burning you know three times as many calories as the average person. Right. They're running around everywhere. And it wasn't. It wasn't that much more. It was actually a small, uh, a small amount more, and which makes sense. Their bodies are going to adapt because you, know, you can't just have this crazy roaring metabolism all the time when you're 
you know, uh, hunter gatherer because then you wouldn't have enough food yeah, uh, to support yourself. Whittle away to, to yeah. nothing. But yeah, if your if your strength is going up, that's a great uh, great sign. It's also a great sign that your hormones are in check. I mean, I don't know, Adam, when you when you were doing the, the hormone thing, did you notice like I'm sure you noticed right a big change in how your strength was responding? Oh, I've been you know I've, obviously since I've started this whole process, I get tons of DMs. Probably this is probably one of the most popular thing that I talk about in my DMs right now is my metabolism and how I feel on my hormones and my sex drive and all that stuff. And, you know, all these things that I'm using, you know, I'm using the juve, I'm using the infrared. We've got our products that we're using with Organifi. I've got all these different things. I've got the supplements that you were, you recommended to me that I've used. Like I'm doing all this stuff. Right. And, and I've, I think I've methodically implemented all of them so I can kind of get an idea of what, how each of them are, you know, respond. Which one does what? Yeah. Which one does what, which one's helping me the most. And, and a lot of them have, have, have definitely showed benefits and I, and it's, I've incorporated all of them, but it's like you have all these things, right? The, the red lights, the supplements, the herbs, the diet, all this stuff that I think is really helping. And then strength training is literally in its league of its own for this. And it's almost been a blessing in disguise that this, I've gone through all this to really cement this in even my own brain, because it, it, was hard for me to get motivated to to train at that when I was going through all this really really hard it's I've never felt this before where I mean I love fitness I love working out and you know I never felt so unmotivated to get to the drink gym and lift some weights with my sex drive my libido's down like crazy my testosterone levels super obviously super low so I've got, I don't have that oomph to get inside the gym when I do actually get inside the gym I'm weak I'm fatigued I'm tired it's hard all these things right but what I've recognized and it was really quick it was like the first time I did it like the first like I remember you lifted weights and then you came in the next day and you're like Fuck. Yeah, I was, and so, and thank God I felt that because that was really what, you know, made led to day two and then day three and, you know, so on and so forth where I'm at now. And now I'm a little over a month and a half or so of being consistent with my lifting. And I'm only training about three days a week right now. I haven't ramped up my, I just started to kind of slowly ramp up my volume. I'm going to transition into one of our MAPS programs now. Uh, I feel like my body's getting ready. It's ready for that to take on that much volume, but it was really not that much. But the the impact that it made on my hormones was was insane. Like it's right away, I started to notice my libido, which is the easiest way for me to measure. I'm in a relationship; I can count how many times I want to have sex. I can I can pay attention if I even have the desire to masturbate. I can see all these things. So for me, that's a very very easy thing for me to to ch- to tell when I start adding these things in. And when you first gave me those supplements. And I was doing the infrared. It gave me a nice little bump. Like I definitely felt that. Like sex drive kicked up a little bit. I felt a little better energy, a better attitude, tiny bit. When I started training and started getting really consistent with that again, yes, yeah. yeah. And Katrina was just it's telling huge, me the other night. Yeah. We, I mean, she was just like, "You feel like I feel like you're back to normal right now." I'm like, ah, "I wouldn't say I'm back to normal yet. You know, I'm not there yet, but I feel really good." And it, I definitely attribute ninety percent of that to the strength training. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Lifting weights, the ultimate aphrodisiac. Next question is from Lil Hammy. (laughs) I've been a personal trainer for about seven months now and keep coming across male clients that want to start lifting straight away, even though it's obvious that they're not ready. As a female, I don't want to emasculate them, but I want them to understand the importance of creating proper movement patterns, fixing imbalances, and that starting from scratch is their best approach. I explain this to them, but half the time they just tell me they'd rather just have their asses kicked and put on masks right away. What is the best way to explain this to them? This is the eternal struggle. This is a tough question, actually. It doesn't just happen to women. Female trainers happens to male trainers. Right. Well, it's E. We're talking about ego here. Yep. Well, I have have some tips. In fact, I have something that I'm actually going to do for somebody literally today, and I already have this plan. And uh, I've got this uh, client of mine, female client of mine. Actually, she knows her way around the gym, so she's not, and she's been training off and on maps for the last two years. Uh, but what I know she hasn't been doing, and she's getting up and she's in her thirties now, is I know she hasn't been addressing like her imbalances. I know she hasn't been doing good mobility work. I know that she needs that, and I know that I can give that to her. So far, I've allowed her just to kind of follow our programs and and get in better shape and by aesthetics right we haven't addressed her other issues because i haven't trained her privately well she's coming in to see me today she's a friend of mine and the plan today 
and and I know, and this is my experience talking now. Like old me would try and make them do the mobility moves and force them into that, and and then hear them afterwards like, well, I really just wanted to get a workout. I didn't even get a sweat in. All we did was stuff on the floor and this and that, and it, and then then they don't ever come back again because they want to get there, and they go hire some other trainer who's just going to beat them up. And so there's got to you got to find these ways of like kind of educating them along the way, giving them a little bit about what they want, but then also educating them at the same time. One of the ways that I'll do this with her today is I'll allow, I'm going to allow her to get into her squat right away. Like right away, we'll go to the squat rack, do your squats. And I'm going to let her do a couple sets and I'm going to video her. And then after I video her doing some squats, I'm then going to take her away. And then I'm going to do some work on her that I already know because I've seen her squat. And I'm going to make her do some combat stretch, work on some 90-90s, and then I'm going to do our zone one test with her. That's it. Just three. Even though I know she could use a bunch mm. more, I'm going to pick three that I know that are really impactful. I know that she's got limiting range on her ankle mobility. I know her hips need work. And I know for sure she's got a little bit of forward shoulder like almost every fucking client you'll ever get. So I'll take those three things, and I'm going to do three or four rounds of that, and then I'm going to take her back to the squat and then I'm going to have her squat again. Show her the contrast. And then I'm going to show her the contrast. I'll video it, and then together we'll look at it, mm-hmm. and I'll show her how important that is that I can do that in one fucking visit with me. I can show you how much better your body moves. And I already know, because I've done this a bunch of times, mm-hmm. that when she gets into that squat and she does it, she'll feel better. Mm-hmm. It'll The squat will feel better. She'll feel stronger. And then I'll be able to take the video of her, which is great that we have these tools that I didn't have when I first started as a trainer. And I'll be able to show her, look at your movement and I'll pause the video and I'll point out different contact points, like where her feet were probably pronating before, Mm -hmm. where her, she's falling forward, where her weight was probably shifting to the front of her toes. And I can point out all these things and that's all I got to do. I think if you do things like that, where you're not telling them they can't get a hard workout or you can't do these exercises because you technically, and I used to do this as a trainer. I used to scare people yeah. into- Scare them into the clothes. Yeah, scare them into the clothes on all the corrective stuff yeah. that they do. And I you, did the same thing. Yeah, it was, it was a tactic that I would do to sell them because everybody's dysfunctional, everybody's fucked up somehow, and I have the answers to help you. Regardless, if you just want to lose 30 pounds of fat and look better, I know I can teach you all these other things, and then I would make people do that. I like that even better because, yeah, my- my go-to would be to take them through the mobility and all that and then throw them on the squat, but then to see the contrast and then actually have that visual in their head would be such a more powerful way to break through that ego mm-hmm. because the ego, they know how much they can lift in that particular exercise, right? right. So they don't want to, <laughs> they don't want that to go away. So, you know, for you to be able to kind of point out what's going on with their body and then also like if there's any like inkling of pain you know from their joints or you know you're just sort of prompting them with all these seeds and ideas and uh of what's going on and then what to feel and like really kind of well, take them through it it's like winning an argument right like you if you ever are in an argument or a debate with somebody and all you do is go back and argue your points back and forth like nothing ever gets done so there when someone says something even if i don't agree with it like I'm going to let them know that I, I, I understand what they're saying. And, and then, then what I'll do is absorb that information, go with it for a second, and then I'll come back around and I'll explain my point. So it's kind of like the same thing that you do in a discussion back and forth with somebody is I'm not going to tell them that's wrong or that's going to hurt you or that's bad for you or you can't do that. It's like, absolutely, you can do that. In fact, if you didn't have me, you'd probably go do it on your own because you're already telling me that's what you want to do. So I'm going to give you a little bit about you, what you want. Like I'm going to give you what you want because that's what you're asking for. But then I'm going to find another way to come back around and educate you on why you may want to listen to me and go this way because it's look- almost like, can I now show you another way? Yeah. You yeah, know, like show me yours. I'll show you mine. Yeah. It's a, you know Whoa. what? I, the scene, the scene from yeah. uh, Days of Thunder, I love, right? It, re- it reminds me of the, the, the struggle that Tom Cruise has with uh, what's Robert, is it Robert Duvall, mm-hmm. where he's telling him, he's trying to get coach him on how to drive the car, and he's, he knows because he's a better racer. And he says, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to run 50 laps the way you want to run 50 laps, and then we're going to run 50 laps the way I want to run 50 laps. And then he shows him the tires afterwards. Here's you. You went through fucking way more tires. We were Here's me, and we shaved two minutes off of our time, you yeah. know, whatever it was. So same thing. Here's the other thing, too. You want to, you want to always keep this in mind. When people hire you to train them, they are, you're the expert, okay? So, and this is why this is important to understand. I, and I used to see this more so with female clients training male clients than the reverse. And I think, again, it's because in like this situation, you know, you've got the guy with the big strong ego, you're the female trainer, and you may feel less confident uh, in what you're saying. So remember, you're the expert and be confident in what you're saying. People, clients actually like it 
for the most part, when a trainer says something like, listen, I know what I'm doing. We're going to do it my way. Sometimes, A lot of times people like that because they want to kind of give up and give, in, give the control away and say, okay, you're the trainer. I'll just do what you want. So speak with authority. Speak with confidence. Sell what you're trying to sell. In this case, you're trying to sell you know, uh, correctional movement patterns. So know what you're talking about so you can sell it well. You may want to use some examples like Adam was describing where you show them the difference between doing it one way and doing the other. And then sell and show, look, this is why we're going to do it this way because if you move better, you're going to build more muscle. If you move better, you're going to get stronger eventually than you will moving the wrong way. I know what I'm talking about. I'm the trainer. Let's We're going to do it my way. And, and people a lot of times will respond well to that kind of confidence. Um, but it's look at this. This happens to all trainers. It happens it happened to me all the time. Where I'd get you know male, female, client doesn't matter, and they'll come in and be like, I just want to lose thirty pounds. I just want to work out and get real sweaty and, and, and get real sore. And then I'd sit down and say, Look, here's the here's the deal. I can do that for you, but here's what's going to happen as a result of it. Or we can do it this way, in which it'll take a little longer at first, but it'll stay off. You'll feel better. You'll have more muscle, and you'll have a faster metabolism at the at the, at the end of it. So are you going to trust me? Or is it, or are you going to do this your own way? In which case, I ask you, why'd you hire me in the first place? And um, clients like to hear that kind of confidence. So be very confident in what you're saying. Show them that you have some authority. Explain what's going on and tell them how you're going to do it and how you're going to train them. Sell it well, and usually you'll be okay. And, the, and very sometimes you won't be. Sometimes the client will be like, no, I want to do it this way. In which case, then you got to make the decision whether or not you should train them or not. And I've there's been a f- couple times, not very many, but a couple times where I've taken a client and said, well, in which case I'm not going to train you. Actually, one client in the times of, uh, in the, the whole time I owned my, my personal training studio was, was did, only one time did I have somebody where I told them I'd stop training them and they were just fucked. There was no way they were going to do uh, what I was telling them. But every other time I've had this, these types of debates with people and uh, you know, with women, it's the opposite. I think sometimes I'll have female clients that don't want to lift heavier. Because they're scared of you know building muscle, but you get the guys who want to put too much weight on the bar. I always communicate to people like this too. Like it, I speak in like um, for in general, for a lack of a better word, right? When I'm speaking to them, I go, you know, most people when they train, they want to do. You know, what I'm saying, mo- but I'm really talking to them, right? So I'm I'm, I'm talking. I had a client once that. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So I, I do that a lot of times versus attacking them on their idea or what they want from you, because if you do that, they're going to put a wall up and then they're not going to be receptive. So. You know, when someone tells me, oh, I just want to get my ass kicked, I say, yeah, yeah, don't worry. We're going to kick some ass. I yeah. promise you. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to kick some ass for sure. And then I tell, then I'll, uh, then I'll come back around and kind of tell them like, oh man, a lot of times when I get clients, you know, they want to come in, they want to train really hard. And these are the things that happen. And this is yeah. why, why you don't want to do that. And this is why this is a better approach. And so you educate like that versus getting into a debate on them and yeah. what they want to do. They're wrong. You're right. It's like, no, go ahead and agree with what they're saying. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then come back around and I speak to them in like general, like I said, like where I'm just talking to them as, you know, most people or, you know, lots of people that I train like want this and this is why yeah. it's not a good and, idea. And Another, another thing that's very powerful and it's understated is setting the stage. So what I mean by that is client hires you, you sit down before you're going to go work out and you say, okay, what are your goals? You know, let's say he says, my goal is to build a lot of muscles. Excellent. You know, that's one of my specialties. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on this first because if I can get you to have good recruitment patterns, we're going to get way more out of the exercises right. and you'll build way more. Mu- so break it down and explain them before you go out on the workout floor because this is a tough dis- it's a tough discussion to have on the workout floor. Like I'm taking you out and the guy's saying, oh, I want to add more weight. And then you're going to have this discussion. Or ask a simple question like, are you are you looking just to lose as much weight as we can in the next six, seven weeks or do you want to set you want me to set you up for lifetime fitness? Like forever. Like, do you want to be healthy and fit forever, or you just want me real quick to get you in the most shape we can in seven weeks? Because there is some truth to that. Like, if I only got a few weeks with somebody and all they care about is as much we can, can we burn as much of this and do that? Like, you're right. In in a, in a small window, a small study of four weeks. I mean, absolutely, you could you could do a lot more than what I would probably do with you for sure. And so if that's all you care about, like, well, then let's do that. Just let, I just want to let you know, though, if you want long-term results, it's going to look more like this, and then you explain why. Absolutely. So go to our show notes and sign up for our, uh, what is it, our event at Viore in Encinitas. On what's the date there, May 10th? May 10th. May 10th. May 10th. Go sign up for it. First come, first serve. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. 
If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.